morning, and as is our custom, I invite you to please stand for our reading from the gospel. And he, Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on a path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil, though. But when the sun rose, they, went, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Praise God for the hearing and the reading of these sacred words. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Bob Tuttle was his name. He's a scholar of John Wesley, biographer of a missionary by the name of E. Stanley Jones. He covered the world. He went all across the world, and he re researched different world religions, and he taught, I think, at, I, can, I can think of four different seminaries throughout his career. He was an eclectic guy, Mr. Tuttle was. He was an evangelical in the sense that he believed in the importance of Jesus. He was a prophet in that he preached the importance of social justice. He was charismatic and that he believed in the capacity and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform a person's life. And as a, as a boy, I remember Tuttle coming to my home church at Lagoda United Methodist Church, and I remember he made a good many of the religious people there in my church in those days a little bit uncomfortable, which in my book, in those days, was a big check mark in my box. <laughs> he once posed the question, though, and it's an intriguing question, he said, what is the least amount a person can believe and still be a Christian? I like that question. And the reason I like that question is because it invites us to, to cut to the core, to get past the fluff, to differentiate between what really matters and what doesn't matter. What's the least amount a person can believe and still be a Christian? Now, that is a tough question to answer because there's so many different voices and there's so many different people saying so many different things within the life of Christianity today. Some people will say this and other people will say that. Some people will say we have to believe this and still other people say we have to believe that. And some people will say, well, any person should be able to define what they mean to be a Christian, what, what they want to mean to be a Christian or what they want it to mean to be a Christian. But here's the way Tuttle answered it. He went back to the New Testament. He said that, from the beginning, the creed of Christianity was basically three simple words. Jesus is Lord. God loves us in a Christ-like way. Therefore, our lives work best towards Christ-like ends. That's true for us as individuals, as community, and even as a nation. Or to say it another way. God loves and cares for us and wants nothing more than to provide us a power and a strength to get through this life. You see, the storyline of Christianity really is a three-part story. There's good news, then there's bad news, and there's good news again. Let me explain. The good news is this. We're made in the image of God. I take that phrase from the opening pages of the Bible, the opening pages of Scripture. The Bible, Scripture says, we're made in the image of God. The story goes, God created the world, spoke everything into existence, into, into being. God looked at it, said it was good, and said humanity was made in the image of God. Now, the thing that's interesting about the creation account that we have in our Bible is this. In the time in which it was written, there were other creation accounts. And those other creation accounts said basically the gods had a war in heaven and it was out of violence that God created the world. But the Hebrew people and the Hebrew prophets didn't see it that way. They believed that, that God created the world out of love, generosity. God spoke this world into existence and everything that we see is a manifestation of the outpouring 
of God's love. And to be made in the image of God is to be made in the image of that God. We become aware of God's love for us, and we seek to embody that love in all that we do. That's the good news. Bad news. Remember, it's a three-part story. The bad news is we turn against that love, don't we? And we forget about God's presence in our life. We, we fall into sin. And now I know that word sin will make a good many of us here today squirm in our seats a little bit. It reeks of guilt and shame and other things that we're hoping to get rid of. I get it. When I say we fall into sin, though, here's what I want you to understand. I don't believe it's that we're horrible, awful people. I don't. I will say that we are, as humanity, we are created quite capable of horrible, awful things. Yes, I'll say that. But when I say we fall into sin, I'm not saying we're horrible, awful people from the start. I believe we're created in the image of good God. But when I say this, what I mean is this. We fall short when it comes to our worship of God. We, we aim too low when it comes to our worship of God. Let me explain by what I mean by that. We have a tendency to worship the creation as if it were our creator. We have a tendency to worship the material things in such a way that we think that they will provide for us our, our deepest happiness rather than the God that made them. And when we do that, friends, our lives get out of order. We're out of order for with ourselves. We're out of order with one another. We're out of order with our neighbors and even God when we begin to worship the creation as if it were our creator. That's where the violence comes from. That's where the greed comes from. That's when we get out of sorts with ourselves. All right. Good news, bad news, good news again. Even though our love falls short and we lose track, the gospel says that God continues to love us anyway. Even though our, loves, our love is inconsistent, even though it fails, God's love is constant. This is confirmed over and over again through the scriptures. The prophets are sent. The teachers are sent. The preachers are sent. But above all, Christ is sent through Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection. What we find is that in the Christian language, the incarnation of God's love. Or the way I would phrase it, we find the intensification of God's love. We, we see a picture of the love of God that never, ever left us. Jesus is God's good news in the midst of our bad news sent to bring us home. Jesus is, in a nutshell, Lord. Now, that all sounds well and good. And we want to believe that, and I think we probably want to leave that, believe that in the depths of our own hearts, and the depths of our own spirits and souls. But yet the problem is, even though it seems pretty straightforward and clear, it's easier said than done, right? Hence the parable today, the parable of the sower. We've been going through the different stained glass windows, and today we're up to the parable of the sower, which is the third one on my left, and it's the third one from the front of the sanctuary on your right. And uh, the sower, well, we'll just take a look at it, and Jesus gives us four different options for receiving his message. At the top of our window, we, of course, see Jesus. And the way I envision Jesus here is he's proclaiming the good news of God's love and kingdom to us. It's then that he gives four different ways that people respond. The first way he gives us is the one where you see the birds there. If you look close at the window, there's the birds. What's this represent? Well, the first option that Jesus gives for people in terms of how they receive his message is that he said the seed was thrown on bad soil hard soil. It wouldn't even take root, and the birds, and the, if you remember the parable, the birds come and they, they take it away. What does this group represent? Well, I don't think, if you look at the Gospels, the hard-hearted folks in the Gospels are the horrible and awful sinners that we often think of. Not prostitutes, not criminals, not horrible, awful sinners. Who are the hard-hearted people in the Gospels? Who are they? Who are the ones that give Jesus the most problems? The religious people, right? They are the hard-hearted people. In fact, it's the religious people who play a huge role in Jesus' own crucifixion. Now, the thing I always find myself wondering is why did Jesus have such 
problems with the religious people of his time. I mean, they were ethical people. They were moral people. They went to worship on a regular basis. Why did Jesus have such a problem with them? And the best I can explain it would be this. They had the principles, but yet to, they had yet to experience the presence. They had the laws, but they had yet to experience a life-giving encounter with God. They had the container, but they lacked, quite frankly, the content. I remember when I was a young pastor, I was just getting started, I struck up a conversation with one of my neighbors. And inevitably, I, I invited this person to church. I wanted them to come to church with me. And I'll never forget my neighbor's answer as I invited him to church. He said, why do I need to go to church? All it is is a bunch of morals anyway. And I remember that conversation very vividly because I stumbled over how to respond to him. I really didn't have a good answer for him. And spoiler alert, he did not come to church. If I had an opportunity to answer that question again today, it would be this. You're right, friend. Morals and ethics are important. They're very important. Without morals and ethics, we destroy ourselves and one another. I'll be honest. But they're really only half of the story. You see that the morals and ethics are more or less like characteristics that lead us to the, the character of God the one that is most revealed in Jesus Christ. And until we come to realize that, we have a form of religion, but it's cold. How do you tell the difference? Well, you know the difference. You've met people that have a form of religion, but they have yet to have the encounter, and here's how you can tell the difference. They are always worried about making sure that everyone else falls into their box rather than living out the message. And I will add, they are very unhappy in the way they go about it. That's the hardness of heart. Second option Jesus gives for those who receive his message or how they respond to his message is that sometimes... It's like seed thrown in the midst of the rocks. The soil is, is not very deep. And the sun comes in and scorches it, and you can see the sun in the window here, and the seed withers away and dies. What does this represent? Well, it represents people who mistake faith for feelings. They think to have faith means they chase after good feelings. One feel-good experience after another feel-good experience after another feel-good experience. The problem with mistaking our faith for feelings is when life gets difficult, things don't go as we want, we walk away. And I'm not saying that feelings are bad. No, I'm not saying that at all. Feelings are, are very important. In fact, I, I know this will be a surprise to you, I much prefer the positive emotions over the negative ones. I do. But what Jesus is saying here when he says, basically, be careful that you don't be like the, the seed on the rocky soil, what he's saying here is that we can have an emotion without having to be the emotion. That we have to be grounded by something deeper. Third response, and I'm going to move quickly. Third response Jesus gives us is the thorny soil. The seed is thrown in the midst of the thorns. What does this represent? Well, I believe that what this, this, rep, this option basically represents people who get caught up in material things. Over and again, Jesus warned against material things and the use of material things. In fact, the number one thing that he preached on, even more than prayer, was the use of wealth. I don't know if people really realize that, but if you read the Gospels, one of the number one things Jesus preaches on is the use of wealth. It's like thorns that catch on to us and, and pull us away from where we should be. And what is it that it pulls us away from? an awareness of God's presence. It's next to impossible to be aware of God's presence if our lives are filled with many things. Finally, the last response to God's call upon our lives is those that receive the message, internalize it, and bear fruit. Who are these people? I believe they're evangelical in the sense that they believe that Jesus is important. 
They preach social justice in the sense that they believe that love extends to all of creation and no one is exempt. And they trust in the power of the Holy Spirit working through them to enable them to make it possible. Think about it this way. About two weeks ago, I was asked to teach the uh, teenage Sunday school class at, here at Methodist Temple. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity. Our youth director, Ryan Buxton, was on vacation and went to Florida. And so I was invited to teach the class uh, along with uh, Marissa Zimmer. Hey, Marissa. Um, and the lesson was, interestingly enough, on Jesus and his relationship to stuff. And I have to be honest, going into it, I was a little bit nervous. How am I going to talk to a group of teenagers about Jesus and his relationship to material things? But the, the lesson was based on a story where a rich man goes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the conversation was really quite interesting because we got talking about heaven and hell. And we got talking about life after death. And it was, it was just so much fun to see their and hear their responses to that question. Uh, one of the students said that they believe that when we die, we just all go to the same place. Another student said they didn't think that was true, that we have sometimes the freedom to accept or reject it. And then another, another student said, how do we know anything is real at all? And how do we know anything that exists at all? And I'm, all the while I'm, I'm hearing them talk about this heaven and hell question, the thing I'm praying about is, Lord, what in the world am I going to say when it turns to me? So, um, and sure enough, it did. It turned to me. They said, Pastor Andy, what do you think? And I paused for a second and I said this. I think there's truth in everything you just said. I really do. I think when we, we die, maybe we all go to the same place. But here's the catch. For some of, that place, some of us, that place might be heaven. And others of us, that place might be hell. Because here's the thing. As far as I can tell, heaven is the place where love is practiced. Love of God, love of others, love of ourselves. And why would I believe any of this? Because I see it every day. You've seen it. I've seen it. We've experienced it in our own lives. We know what it is to turn inward upon ourselves and become selfish. We know what it is to chase after emotion, and then once we capture the emotion, it slips through the fingers. We know what it is to get caught up chasing after material things in this world and how fleeting they are. But we also know what it is to become aware of the life-giving love of God in our lives and experience heaven today. The practice of Christianity is about the practice and the cultivation of a sense of God's presence and love in our lives today. We live in a time, folks, where the discouragement is real. I don't want to sidestep it. We look at a country, we look at our society, we look at the way things are going and it's easy to lose heart. It's easy to say to ourselves, why even waste the kindness on another? Why even waste the love? And what the gospel says is this, no act of kindness no act of love is ever wasted. In fact, it, it strikes at the core of the world and the reality around us. It, it's in harmony with the, the love that formed us and fashioned us and, and makes us even now. I, I began this sermon with the question, what is the minimum that we can believe and still be a Christian? And the answer I gave is Jesus is Lord. Or to say it another way, a Christian is someone that dedicates as much of themselves as they know to as much of Jesus as they know through the power of the Holy Spirit within their life. That is a Christian. My challenge to us all this week, folks, is let us aim high when it comes to our worship of God. Let us not settle for some of the false prophets and the snake oil salesmen of this world who seem to be fine with being hoodwinked with the forces of death. Let's aim for Jesus, because anything less 
it misses the mark. Amen.